Hi there and uh, welcome along to a little video on Doppler. Just going to um, start off by showing you a quick clip of a Formula One car going past. Now we can have a quick look at this animation and see the sound waves coming out from around a plane. Uh, that will help you visualise exactly what's going on and why we get this change of pitch. Remember, we started off talking about sound waves, but this phenomenon applies to all waves, light waves, water waves, everything. OK, we can actually have a go at investigating this phenomena of um, Doppler. Got a little aeroplane and we'll start moving across the screen. So each one of those circles, if you like, represents a wave front and each one is travelling in exactly the same speed in every direction. The thing that's changing is that the plane is moving slightly to the right um, each time it emits a new um, wave front. Let's just do that again, going a bit faster. And that's clearly had a really pronounced effect on those waves. You can see that the waves in front of the aeroplane have a much shorter wavelength um, than we would expect. So if you we were listening to that wave coming towards us, we would hear a high pitch sound because the wavelength is shorter. Wave speed is still frequency times wavelength. So if you've made the wavelength shorter, we'd expect a higher frequency. And that's what we heard when the, we heard the Formula One car approaching. On the other side behind, you can see the wavelength is much larger. Uh, the waves have been spread out because each one has had to travel a slightly greater distance as the wave moved further away to the left. That explains the lower frequency sound once the object is passed, uh, like you heard earlier in the Formula One car. Right, we're just going to continue our look at um, Doppler now. What we've got here, um, I thought an ambulance was too controversial, so I've made it into an AA van. Um, we've got um, the sound sound waves in front, we've got a reduced wavelength, uh, sound wave um, behind, we've got an increased wavelength. So. The equations are all going to be written in terms of delta lambda, change in wavelength, and delta frequency. So we can see in front of the ambulance, the wavelength has gone down and the frequency has gone up. And behind the ambulance, the wavelength has increased, but the frequency has decreased. Now, when you look at the equations we're going to use on the um, data sheet, and here they are, you'll see there's a minus sign associated with these. And that minus sign is really only there to tell us that the change in wavelength and the change in frequency are opposite in sign. It doesn't really work in practice um, to use that sign in any meaningful way, because you then have to have a convention for knowing whether velocities towards your velocities or away from you, from you were positive. So what you're going to have to do is just kind of remember what I've said here. So in practice, the way we use the equations is delta lambda over lambda, the fraction by which the wavelength has changed by is approximately equal to V over C. Same with change in frequency over frequency, approximately equal to V over C. These equations are strictly speaking only true if V is very, very much less than the C, the wave speed. Um, in reality, in this unit, you'll see that we actually apply that when that's not true, even to the point where V is greater than C. So you just need to plow on, but you could be asked for it um, as an assumption used in the derivation. Let's have a go now uh, applying that in an astrophysics situation. So almost always when we're applying this in an astrophysics situation, we'll be imagining um, uh, looking at a spectrum for being um, an absorption line something like that. Um, when we see, I'll just rewrite the equation, delta lambda over lambda equals V over C. That lambda there is always the lab version or no relative velocity. It's the observation made of the wavelength from somebody who's got not moving relative to the to the atoms that made that absorption spectra. So we might go out. OK, let's make this the blue end. And this is the red end. And we take a picture of a star and we come to the conclusion that our um, 
absorption line instead of being here is here so the first thing we would say is that this line has been blue shifted it's been moved to a shorter wavelength so undoubtedly the star is um, in this case moving towards us remember with galaxies the vast majorities of galaxies will be moving away and they'll be red shifted what we're looking at here is slightly different uh, stars may be moving towards us or away from us particularly in the case of binary stars which we're going to come on to so say we knew that this absorption line was at 400 nanometers and then in the doppler shifted spectrum it was 380 nanometers we could now go and we could now use that information to work out how fast that star is coming towards us so delta lambda is the difference between the two hopefully you can see that's 20 nanometers so that's delta lambda on the top and then lambda on the bottom it's always the lab version like that and that equals the velocity it's moving away from us over the speed of light which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second because um, they're both in nanometers that cancels um, so we get v is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 over 20 over 400 uh, 20 over 400 um, okay, no, thing on the calculator it's a 50th isn't it let's just do the whole thing properly yeah you can see it gives 1.5 times 10 to the 7 meters per second okay what we've got here is a little animation showing us a binary star system you can see those twirling array and how we might this we might detect this um, as an observer so we're imagining that the resolution of our telescope isn't high enough to see these as two stars however we are taking a spectrum now, the first thing to understand is that the colors of the lines in the spectrum, you can see them moving around at the bottom. They don't represent the wavelengths that we're seeing um, or the colors we're seeing of this line, um, which I imagine would be an absorption line. What they're just showing us is that which star they relate to. So one's a bit more orangey in color and one's a bit more red in color. So if I just stop it in a moment, there we go. What can we see? Well, we can see that at the top the yellow star is moving away from our observer and therefore its line is red shifted it's moved to a longer wavelength towards the red end of the spectrum underneath that you can see the blue star has moved to the left it's moving towards the observer so it's being blue shifted it's being shifted to a shorter wavelength so an astronomer um, might look through their telescope take that spectrum see that line split in two and that would be a suggestion there was a binary star and i'm just going to use the step function to move through of course they might come back later and they might make that observation and that would tell them um, that approximately a quarter of a um, orbit has, occurred, has taken place and the, neither star is moving away um, or towards the observer we'd say they were mo it's moving across the line of sight and therefore there is no doppler shift at this point the astronomer might come back later, um, retake this measurement, take this photograph um, of a spectrum, and now that they can see that, that the um, yellow star is moving towards them and the blue star is moving away from them, again, the colours don't relate to any physical features of the star, we're just um, keeping track of them. If they took photographs over a long enough period of time, they would have two crucial pieces of information. They would know the speed of each star. Now, these two stars are the same mass. So we can imagine that because they've got the same mass, um, they will each have the same um, radial velocity. But we know how big that velocity is. We can also work out the time period by knowing the time between the uh, maximum um, red shift um, or the maximum blue shift of each star so we can actually construct a huge amount of information about the orbits of stars I thought it'd be worth just having a quick look at what happens actually when we have two stars not of equal mass so clearly in this case you can see the pink star um, is four times less mass than the yellow star uh, the simplest way of saying what they're doing is that they're um, orbiting their mutual center of gravity the center of gravity is much much closer to the yellow star so therefore it has a much smaller radius orbit in the 
uh, ratio of their radii of their orbits will be the same as the ratio uh, of their masses. But in terms of this pair being a spectroscopic binary, we would be able to detect this and detect that ratio of masses because we would see that the peak velocity of the pink star is four times the pink velocity of the yellow star. Um, so building that over a period of time, we would know two, two velocities and their orbital period. So we really do know um, a lot about um, binary stars, even though we can't necessarily resolve them as two separate stars through a telescope. I'm just going to make a quick little summary of what we should know about Doppler because we've jumped around all over the place. Uh, I think we can keep it quite simple. Approaching objects will show what's called blue shift. And it doesn't matter when we say approaching, there's no difference between uh, an object moving towards us or us moving towards the, ob um, or towards the object. What we will see is that the wavelength will apparently be decreased and the frequency will be increased. Since, since the high pinch whine of a Formula One car is coming towards us. Um, hence, if we were looking at a pair of spectroscopic stars, if one of the stars is coming towards us, any absorption lines would be shifted to a short um, into the short part of the spectrum. The opposite is redshift. Redshift applies to receding objects. If objects are moving away, they have a longer wavelength and a decreased frequency. In both cases, we can use these um, highly simplified equations to work out the velocity. Wave speed is going to be the speed of light um, if we're dealing with uh, anything in astronomy, really, because we're dealing with the electromagnetic spectrum. But they do apply equally well to uh, sound waves. I've re removed the minus sign because I think you just have to remember whether things are increasing or decreasing rather than having a sign convention. Right. Let's find you some questions to practice on now.